Hey, YouTuberverse, coming up, Star Talk Cosmic Queries. A look at 30 years of the Hubble Space Telescope. This is Star Talk. I'm your host, Neil deGrasse Tyson, your personal astrophysicist. And I got with me Chuck Nice. Chuck, yes. Chuck in the house. Neil. All right. This is a Cosmic Queries edition. Absolutely. And we're celebrating 30 years of the Hubble Space Telescope. Wow. Yeah. 30. It was launched in 1990, April. Look at that. Yeah. And we're talking across someone right here. I know. So customer. rude of us. <laughs> so so rude. very rude of us. <laughs> Edwin would be ashamed. <laughs> um, <laughs> so... So we have Jennifer Weissman. Jennifer, welcome. Thank you. I think you're your first time visiting it's here. It's wonderful to be you know, We go way back, but your first time. So yes. That's long overdue. And uh, what, I got your pedigree here. Senior project scientist for the Hubble Space Telescope at the NASA Goddard. Um, uh, uh, what's the full? Goddard? Space Flight Center. Goddard, Goddard, yeah. we, have, we have a Goddard here. See, we have, we have a Goddard, Goddard Institute exactly. for Space Studies. Yeah, we yeah. have a Goddard Institute for Space Goddard, Goddard got around. Goddard. He, yeah. He had a rocket, so yeah. he got around. <laughs> 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 so the Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. Right Correct. Out, right yes. outside of Washington, D.C. And you're primarily responsible for um, making sure Hubble is as scientifically productive as possible. Wow. And sure enough, that's what it has been. We're going to get into that. Yeah, there's a lot and, of good and stuff. And you're professionally, which, what would you say is your special, your cosmic specialty? I'm interested in how stars continue to form mm -hmm. in interstellar clouds. So, oh, so all yeah. those pictures from Hubble with right. the stuff with the clouds. Yes, that's her. Nice. Well, that's well. not all. <laughs> she <laughs> took them personally. Uh, not exactly. She <laughs> owns them all. Yeah, she owns all <laughs> those pictures. <laughs> right. uh, this is called inflation uh, uh, in some way. No, there are people all over the world studying different aspects aspects of how stars and planetary systems around them presumably mm -hmm. are continuing to form. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, cool. so but, but it's you in the, in the right place to to be fed Absolutely. We're, we're just uh, we're we're blessed to be fed with all this new information from the Hubble Space Telescope and also telescopes, uh, all kinds of other telescopes in space and on the ground. We use them all together right. in complementary fashion. So well, you kind of layer the information uh, to put it together and get a dare I say it, a better picture. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I think of it like a symphony orchestra. The conductor is pulling out some parts of the music from the trumpets and some from the percussion and some from the violins and so forth. But all together, it gives you the full piece of music. So astronomers use some information from the Hubble Space Telescope, some from other space telescopes, some from telescopes on the ground. They all have some different niche. You know, they, they get some different colors or parts of the wavelength spectrum or a different types of fields of view and precision. And we use all that together to answer the questions we have about galaxies or stars or planets or whatever we're interested in. So tell me, you don't just happen to be at the Goddard Space Flight Center. That's where Hubble is controlled. The Hubble uh, Space Telescope control room is, yes, at the uh, NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. Then what's that Hubble building on the campus of Johns Hopkins? At Johns Hopkins, we have the Space Telescope Science Institute, which is a wonderful place with hundreds of scientists and other specialists who work with us at Goddard to help us manage the daily science operations of Hubble, to help with the selections of which proposals that are sent in from around the world actually Ooh. get the time on the Hubble telescope. I don't uh -huh. think people think much about that. They, yeah. no. the, the, the data just show up. Right. Right. But somebody, somebody had, had to do an American Idol version of, <laughs> yo, I need Hubble. <laughs> exactly. That's the next big show coming to Fox. Yes. Yo, I need Hubble. Show me your proposal, show, right? 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 <laughs> That's, it, that's a really good analogy, but uh -huh. it's not done quite the way it's done in terms of the TV shows. What's done is that scientists around the world will write a, a written proposal mm -hmm. for why they want to use the Hubble Space Telescope. Why are the observations they want to do so important to advance science, and why do they need the Hubble Space Telescope to do that? Okay. As opposed and, to any other telescope exactly. right. that they could exactly. be applying for time on. Right, right. Because right. right. you, you don't want to waste... Uh, I don't want... Uh, I think this is true for the allocation committee. They're not going to give you time for a proposal that you could do on a ground-based telescope. Okay. Because space-based telescopes are so expensive and so precious every moment of observing time. Right? Exactly. Yeah. So you have to make the case. Of why is it important that we use this precious time with the Hubble telescope to observe this particular galaxy or this particular exoplanetary system? 
And why do we need the Hubble telescope or the particular instruments that are on Hubble to do that? And that goes through a pretty stringent peer review process. We have specialists mm -hmm. come in and review all the proposals mm -hmm. and rank them. And in the end, basically one in four or one in five get uh, time on the Hubble Space Telescope. What's it like on American Idol? Is it one in five? Um, I think a, a little bit low. Less than that. <laughs> <laughs> so you're better off applying for Hubble time yeah, than maybe. winning so, America. I, I, actually, it's, it's, yeah, you probably are, but probably not, to be honest. Although I should add that we're pretty good about storing this data. So once the observations are done with Hubble, the, the data are put in an archive that's okay. easily accessible. And so scientists around the world often go into that archive, pull out data that's already there, already there. but they can use it for something else. And in fact, about half of the results, the peer-reviewed published science discoveries and results coming from Hubble now are based on data that scientists have taken out of that archive. So, so if, you, if you use this, the telescope, then everything that you glean from using it is now open source. Well, it's better well, than that, I think. Is it better? No, than no, that? no, because it's, I had my own motives right. for observing that part of the sky. Right. Yeah. But maybe you have another thing you could extract from the data that I haven't thought of yet. Right. That's right. 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 Exactly. That's right. 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 So it's but like, there is nothing proprietary. But. Well, there is. If, there for, is. for some types of okay, observations. Now I'm interested in that. <laughs> <laughs> no. See, now that's all I care about is who gets the who gets yeah. the proprietary stuff. There are some types of proposals where the proposing team get a few months. Jennifer's got a yeah. my this is my cluster. Right. This exactly. Is my. <laughs> no, nobody owns anything in the universe uh, personally, but uh, not but yet. But go on. Some of the some of the proposals the proposing team gets a few months of time to do what they actually propose to do and do it well because we want them to have the time to do it well okay. and then the data gets put in this archive and then it's open to everyone and you. so and there are other types of observations that are uh, generally done like big surveys and things that the let's say the director of the space telescope science institute decides would be a good general purpose use of hubble and that data immediately goes into public uh, per view. So, so it can be immediately used by scientists around the world, but anybody in the public can reach the archive. We also have an image gallery that I think is probably of more interest to most general people in the, in the science interested public. And that yeah. uh, you can find at uh, our websites, nasa.gov slash Hubble or hubblesite.org. But these have the images, the, the things that you really think about when you think of Hubble's galaxies or your nebulae. Desktop screen right. saver, your screensaver. Yeah, screen exactly. Right. exactly. Uh -huh. uh, that's where you go, and that's just all free to anyone around the world to use and, and enjoy. And, and that's something I'm very proud of about the Hubble mission is that we've mm -hmm. made all of this data and all of these images yeah. free for anyone around the world to that's use. That's why Shutterstock and, and, hates you. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, uh, it's inspiring to everyone. No, it is. Yeah. And we thank you yeah. for it. Uh, yeah. Before we get to the questions i got one more um one more inquiry here mm -hmm. the i don't think the public knows that there is some allocation of time that i mean you, you hinted at it but i, I want to hear more so is it still true that the director can just say here's a good idea everyone will benefit let's just do this it's not going through the telescope allocation committee okay so it's a director's discretionary time. Does that still exist? It does. So the, the director of the Space Telescope Science Institute, who currently is Dr. Kenneth Sembach, can, has a certain allocation of, of time with Hubble each year that uh, they can use for what they think is the most, uh, some scientific purpose that might not come through sort of the general competitive process with, with scientists around the world. And usually this time is done is used for let's say a, a kind of big survey or a general purpose observation that will be of use to people for many years to come. Mm -hmm. uh, could, the, could, could it yeah. be used for something that's a little quirky? Mm. A little well, you know, let me tell that you would, that would that that would a little ins, quirky. You, you yeah. would have to have a great deal of trust in that director. You know. Well, that's what when you I believe <laughs> that there are aliens in NGC thirty eight oh one. I'm positive. <laughs> 
All right. <laughs> well, let me assure you that we take great care in choosing the directors of the Space Telescope Science <clears throat> Institute. We okay. had excellent ones. I'm going to refrain. And so I'll mention a couple of these that I think are particularly noteworthy. They're not political appointees. I, I think is the say, point. Yeah, okay, right. right, right. The uh, the current uh, Institute Space Telescope Science Institute director, Dr. Ken Simbach, has very wisely allocated director's discretionary time to do a lot of observations in the ultraviolet part of the spectrum, oh. looking at stars and star forming regions that, that radiate light in this high energy frequency range. Well, why is that? Well, that's because Hubble is really the only general purpose telescope right now that can see, see in, in the, the ultraviolet. Right. And you have to be above the Earth's atmosphere to see in the ultraviolet mm -hmm. because of the filtering effects of the atmosphere. Unless you're Geordi LaForge. Well, exactly. But <laughs> this is this is important to get this data and right. get it in the archive while we can. And then we can use it for many years to come. There's another director's discretionary project that I think is really noteworthy, and this came from years ago. A, a previous director, um, Dr. Uh, uh, Bob Williams, used his director's discretionary time to just point off in a direction of space where there weren't very many nearby stars to drown out the image and just collected light for many what, days. What, was he crazy? Well, Pointing people, to nowhere? Yes, exactly. exactly. <laughs> Listen, that's pretty dark over there. Yeah, yeah, let's put the telescope. Let's look there. <laughs> so, <laughs> There's yeah. nothing interesting right. there. <laughs> Some people did push back on this and said, this is a very valuable time on this telescope. It's a lot of competition. Why would you, quote unquote, waste your director's discretionary time this way? Because I'm yeah. director. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> but basically it was, uh, you know, let's look and see. We think there are probably some faint galaxies that we'll pick up by just integrating light, receiving light for, for days. But we weren't sure. After several days of doing this, the result was this image that's now iconic. It contains thousands of little smudges of light. They are all galaxies. It's called the Hubble Deep Field, and we've done some subsequent ones called like the it's Ultra Deep it's Field. It's one of the most famous yeah. images it certainly from Hubble. Is. Yeah. And that's it's so my cool. favorite. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And but it really showed us visually what we may have suspected already just from the the physics and the and the the cosmological theories, but that our universe is filled with galaxies, and they come in many different shapes and sizes. Colors and of course, and the intriguing different. thing about the, getting these fields is that you're seeing all these galaxies in one picture, but of course, the ones that are actually farther away, mm -hmm. you're seeing them as they were farther back in time. Right. So if you can somehow tease out which of those galaxies are closer to us and which of them in that image are farther away and compare their, their differences. Are they different in their morphology? Are they different in composition? Sometimes you need other telescopes to get that information. Why does but this you, one look like a exactly. sombrero? <laughs> <laughs> you can see how galaxies have changed over time. Right. So it's a, it's a true time machine that you can now see visually, and Hubble really set the foundation for this kind of pictorial study of galaxy evolution. And, and I think it's just a wonderful accomplishment. That, but that was based on a, a very wise um, but b brave use of director's discretionary a, time with the Hubble great Space story. Telescope. With, with naysayers all, all along. Yeah. And uh, also, once the Hubble sort of pitches tent right, right. there, right. other telescopes can say, I can now get different kind of information from that going same, to the same place. Let me go to the same place. Exactly. Wow. Right. So it's probably yeah. one of the most observed spots on the sky today. It certainly That's is. So right. we now have deep, we have other positions on the sky also that have been observed in these kind of deep field ways using different kinds of telescopes like the Chandra X-ray Observatory or one of, one of Neil's favorites. telescopes mm -hmm. on the ground. And all of these telescopes have different capabilities and so they complement Hubble and are giving us a tremendous understanding of how the universe has changed over time. Yeah, there you wow. go. That's really cool. Yeah. All right. Very, very well, let's cool. Let's go to some I don't know how much time we have in this segment. I don't know how much time we have in this a segment. Couple, we got time for a couple. Okay. Let's do it. Okay. All right. Patreon members first. Yes, we do a Patreon member first. Paying we... fans get their questions yes. first. Okay. Yes. okay. They support us on Patreon. And yes. Quite frankly, we're easily bought. Thank you. <laughs> this message brought to you by Chuck Nice from Star Talk Radio. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, this is Sherry Lynn SK. Uh, she says, Dr. Tyson, Dr. Wiseman, and uh, hey, Chuck. <laughs> <laughs> 
That is not what she said, no. no that is. No, okay. <laughs> no, she, yes. Mm-hmm. As he goes, what are two or three discoveries that laypersons like myself can reference when talking to others about the fantastic contributions Hubble has given us? Right now, all I can say is it took some really pretty pictures of some stuff, and I need better ammo for those of us not literate in astrophysics. Ooh, good question. Ooh, that That's a, a lovely question, question, right? Yeah, rank right. the science. Wait, wait, how, would you, how would you put that? Well, I'm not going to rank uh, rank order because there's a lot Just of between us time, but, and our audience. <laughs> no one else has to know. But I would say there are some profound uh, discoveries in in different realms of astrophysics that Hubble has really made a. a, a a groundbreaking, if you will, or space breaking, if you will, a contribution. I like the change. Did you see what she did there? We we saw what you did there. Space breaking. I think one of the first things Hubble did was to confirm that there are, in fact, supermassive black holes in the cores of galaxies. Mm -hmm. There were, it was theorized that that was the case, perhaps, but what one of the first observations Hubble did was to uh, look at the core of another galaxy, mm-hmm. um, M87, for example, is a, is one of these other galaxies that we knew was kind of active. We could see that there was like a high-speed jet coming out of the core, but we weren't sure what was causing these, these types of things. Hubble looked at another external galaxy and saw that the gas moving around the core of that galaxy was moving very fast. Mm-hmm. And so... When you have something orbiting very fast, but you don't know what it's orbiting, you can pretty easily calculate what the mass of that uh, material is based on the distance from the core that the the material is moving and its velocity. And the only thing that could be that massive in such a small volume had to be a supermassive black hole. So Hubble then became what we call our supermassive black hole finder because with subsequent instruments on Hubble, we actually looked at the cores of lots of other uh, galaxies and confirmed over and over again that supermassive black holes are often, if not always, perhaps in the cores of galaxies. So what 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 went un, un implied but not stated there is mm-hmm. you needed Hubble to do that because Hubble has very high resolution. Exactly mm-hmm. right. Other telescopes it's just a smudge and you can't find something so close to a, a yes. tiny center. Exactly. Right. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. that's a point that needs to be made. The reason Hubble is there at all is because we right. put it above the atmosphere. The atmosphere has a blurring effect on light coming mm-hmm. through and it even filters out some types of light. So Hubble being above the atmosphere gives us very high resolution above observation. It all. Nice. Exactly. <laughs> and that's why uh, we were able to use Hubble to just to discern this gas right around the cores of other galaxies. And on one side, it seemed to be moving away from us very fast. That would be the the red shifted uh, 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 gas, and on mm-hmm. the other side of the center of, this, of those galaxies, we'd see stuff that appeared to be moving toward us very fast, mm-hmm. blue-shifted light. Mm-hmm. And so you can tell that the material is orbiting very fast, and from that calculate that the only thing that would create orbits that fast would be a lot of mass condensed in a very small volume, and the only go. thing that answers that question There's are black supermassive hole. black holes. So mm-hmm. now let me ask you, when you, you as you yeah. talk about this process, what immediately comes to my mind is the process how long does something like this take or is it that you are doing mathematical interpolation or making extrapolations from a period of time that you're looking at the the uh information that you're receiving well, how long does what take just the whole the yeah the whole process, discovery the, the discovery and observation okay and the whole yeah. deal okay like, yeah, good well, point well, yeah from well, proposal yeah. to Pro- published paper right how long does that take <laughs> Well, <laughs> the, I have to say it all depends. So, so, so an observation, depending on what you're doing, like I, I mentioned that deep field took several days of observations. Others, uh, if it's something bright, if it's just one pointing, you can do it maybe in an hour or two. Oh. But then you need to go through some processing time for the, the data comes down, but it needs some data processing uh, you know, in that case, usually we can get images out if they're just simple snapshots within a few days. Wow. Um, but if you're doing scientific analysis, like you're you're doing a proposal to answer some question that requires quite a lot of analysis, maybe com- comparisons with data from other telescopes, these kinds of things, that can take months mm-hmm. or a year, years. Um, okay. sometimes even years. So right. it just depends on the complexity of the question that's being asked and, and, and that's being and the data, how the data are being used. Right, and cool. then you submit the paper, gets peer reviewed. Okay. Yes. Then, oh, then, if it, right. then maybe they want adjustments to it because right. you didn't dot your I or cross your T. Mm-hmm. Then you do that, satisfy the, yeah. the, the reviewer, 
then it gets accepted for publication, then it gets scheduled, right? And so that that adds yeah. a chunk of time at the end there yeah. as well. But So now that makes me think of another question. I know we're short on time, but w what happens if somebody is looking for something or they say, propose this, and then the peer review comes back and says, no, 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 but then you find something even bigger. Has that ever happened? Well, first of all, there are two... We don't have time, Chuck. Oh, okay. We got to go to break. Well, I guess that is an answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. There's your answer, Here's Chuck. There's your answer, Chuck. We don't have time. All right. Uh, Hubble, 30th anniversary on Star Talk when we return. We last left off with Chuck in the middle of the question. <laughs> what happens if whatever issues a first proposed research paper confronts, right. they, they, they discover something even better? Right. Oh. Well, the peer review says, oh, no, that's not the case. And then they find something that's like, whoa. Wait, the peer reviewers or the well, writers? Both. Either a one. Any Anybody goes, wow. But they missed something. They missed something. And then they go, oh, my goodness. I just okay. want to know if that ever happened. Like, I'm, I have a thing for that. To like like radio caritonomy, like guy cut his eye and he goes, wait, I can see. Whoa, who knew? Like that, I love oh, that. Okay, you know. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me try to parse that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, again, the, these observations typically go through two peer reviews. One is to get the time to use Hubble in the first place. Uh, so so that means that the, the they generally had a pretty good idea uh, right. of why these observations would be useful. Right. And then there's the second one when they after they've done the analysis of the data and they submit their analysis to the the professional journal of what they think they found. And true enough, the journals can actually say, uh, you know, we don't actually think this is this is right or profound, and maybe choose not to publish it. Or, but usually they do. What's interesting, yeah, by though, then by they then, they yeah, but yeah. what's interesting is that that data that may have been used for the initial proposer's purposes is now available for other researchers to use. And as we discussed about the archive, they can pull that data and find something that the original proposer didn't even think of right. to use with this data, and that has happened. Quite a lot. Let me tell you why. It becomes a whole other research paper. It becomes, yeah, exactly. and, and the reason is because Hubble has been around so long, 30 years now, of often taking sometimes repeated observations of the same areas in the sky for different purposes. Uh, we can now look back and see things that have changed over time, which is very interesting, in particular in our solar system, looking back at images of, let's say, Jupiter over time, year after year after year, and then starting to compare these images and saying, whoa. As we look back at this data that may be even taken for different purposes in earlier years, but we can see trends. Let's say that big, uh, great red spot mm -hmm. on Jupiter. It's a big storm. But as we look over the decades way, Chuck, of Chuck, you know what its official term is? No. Jupiter's red spot. Oh, there you <laughs> exactly. go. <laughs> right. Just, just so you know. Just so you can stay with the lingo here. I don't understand. I don't want her to lose you. Yeah, why well, you guys got to get all fancy. <laughs> I think it's, we're trying to make it clear. The great red spot is is there, but it is red. It's a red is a spot. However, it is shrinking as we look at these whoa. images year after year after year. Like, whoa, this storm is changing. It's changing in color. It's getting smaller. We see new storms cropping up. Uh, so this is one of the benefits of having a telescope operating so long and being able to look back in that archive at data that may have been taken for some other purpose, but then stringing it all together and we see how things have changed, are changing over time. Did you uh, find the monolith in the red spot? Uh, oh, she's can't, she cannot authorize. Next question. Is, uh, next question. Uh, none detectable. Oh, okay. Look she's at not that. authorized now, to go beyond that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> now I'm seeing a conspiracy. <laughs> All right. Robert Weaver from Patreon wants to know this. What is the most interesting unexplained thing we have observed with Hubble? Is there something that astrophysicists are still trying to work out? Love that it. That Hubble who, has who, who revealed? Asked that? Who asked that? Uh, Robert Weaver. Robert Weaver. Way to go, Robert. You are uh, you have impressed the room. So. Mm hmm. Robert, that's a terrific question, and uh, I, a, a couple of things come to mind. Um, Hubble is observing a lot of effects of what we call dark matter, mm. and so we can't really see dark matter, and we don't know what it is. It's a mystery, but Hubble can see where it is because it's distributed pretty heavily uh, in these clusters of galaxies. We can mm. see the galaxies, but we know there's a lot more stuff in there because Hubble sees what's called lensing of light coming from behind those clusters of galaxies that's traveling through that cluster, and it gets 
distorted. It gets uh, magnified and stretched out. And so background galaxies look kind of strange when they come through these regions. And we can, because of that, we can map out where the dark matter is, but it's still a mystery as to what it it actually is. Mm -hmm. And even more mysterious is something we call dark energy, because this is a, a, a surprise. We were looking uh, uh, at, we've been, for all all of Hubble's mission, we've been measuring very carefully the expansion rate of the universe. That was one of the original goals of Hubble. But just a few years ago... Hey, wasn't it, that yeah. one of the original reasons why it was named Hubble? Well, exactly. Because so Edwin, Edwin Hubble, Hubble himself discovered the expanding universe. Exactly. And so that if, if, if this telescope was going to go all in on that, you might as well name it after the guy who put it on the map. Exactly. Yeah. So Hubble mm-hmm. was... One of the first goals of Hubble was to measure better the rate of the mm-hmm. expansion of the universe. We expected that as we were became better able to look at more distant galaxies, which is looking back at time and measuring the expansion rate at that time and comparing it to the expansion rate in the current epoch, that we would see that the expansion rate of the universe has been slowing down. That was the expectation because gravity basically is trying to pull things together and per- perhaps slow down this expansion. Mm-hmm. The surprise in recent years was that by comparing Hubble observations with also te- observations from good telescopes on the ground and looking at the difference between the expansion rate in the distant universe, meaning far in the past, mm-hmm. with the expansion rate in our current epoch, that the universe expansion rate has has actually in recent epochs, meaning in recent billions of years, um, been getting faster. It's accelerating. It for, it was first decelerating and now it's accelerating. Uh, we don't know what's causing that. Mm. Hubble's a big player in this in this discovery. It's not the only player, but it's a big player. And so now this is a whole new enterprise in astrophysics is trying to understand. What is it that could be accelerating the expansion of the universe? We're getting mm. better with age. That's all. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> all right. Tacking on a billion years, you look. You look looking even better. That's right. That's right. <laughs> look at that. All right. Cool, man. All right. So let's go to Cameron uh, Kessler from Facebook. It says, does Hubble have any sufficient technology to keep up with the needs of today's understanding of the universe? And will there ever be a telescope with a 360 panoramic view like Google Street Maps? Uh, <laughs> that's a pretty cool. That's, that's, the, that's the measure that's the of measure the future of the cosmic future discovery. Of cosmic discovery yeah, yeah. is will we have a Google Cosmos Maps <laughs> like Google Street Maps? Um, I know the Mars rovers do this, their pictures, uh, but would it make more sense to have this sort of thing instead of falling back on the, now this is get thrown a little shade here, the excuse, we have to look in the right places, as they used to say in SETI. Ooh. <laughs> but, but I'm trying to understand the question. Is it, in other words, is it, let's look everywhere instead of in places we think we want to right. find something. Exactly. Because we might discover something we're not looking for otherwise. What, basically, he's that. saying, like Google Maps. Like, right. So it's just like, I really want to go to 359 Main Street, but what's that over there? Oh my God, that coffee shop looks pretty okay, awesome. Okay. I'm going to go check it out. <laughs> All right. So this is a very good question. And we need both because we want to be able to see everything in the sky. And we have survey telescopes that are designed to do just that, to have big fields of view and to survey the entire sky, often for a particular reason. So uh, right now, for example, we have the TESS satellite that's surveying the sky, but looking specifically for stars that may have planetary systems around them in our nearby neighborhood. Is it fair to think of yeah. TESS as a follow-on to Kepler? I think so, yeah. yeah. And yeah. TESS, get yeah. me through that. Uh, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, I think. I'm, I, I'm going to have to remind okay. myself. But but anyway, the the idea of TESS is to do just that, that survey makes, the be sky. That would be TESS-IT. Transiting Evidence Survey reason. Telescope, I think. Test right. it. <laughs> Test and then uh, there's, a, there's a telescope uh, being designed for the ground, the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope. The whole idea of this is to do the, the whole sky survey very frequently. So it's a good idea. However, when you're doing that, you're not getting the precision on, in small fields of view that you can get with a telescope like Hubble. So it depends on your the purposes at large. If you really want a, a high angular resolution, precision, high sensitivity observation of something, 
uh, that's a different goal than doing a whole sky survey. Mm -hmm. And we sort of need both of that. So the best way this works is if you're doing whole sky surveys, and then if you find something that you'd really like more detail about, then you hone in with some other telescope gotcha. to do that. Hubble is really not good for these whole sky surveys. It's, a um, it's much better <laughs> for pointing and getting much uh, higher angular it's resolution. My, my favorite example of this is the Orion Nebula. I love the Orion region of the sky. It's a very famous constellation. Um, I did my own doctoral research on, on star formation in this region of the sky. Isn't the closest star forming region to us? It's the closest region of massive star formation okay. so stars bigger than our sun All right. but they light at these massive stars once they form they, they're, they're so powerful they ionize the surrounding gas so you get these beautiful nebulae so mm -hmm. the Orion Nebula is famous Hubble can peer into that so Orion Jennifer was Nebula. born in the Orion Nebula. Yeah. Wow. You know, maybe I was. You know, it's possible. She's a spirit energy it's of the Orion Nebula. Possible I wasn't told, but maybe, you know, you never... Yeah, how would you know? Right? I yeah, yeah. told I was born in Arkansas, but, yeah. you know... Listen, um, in this current climate, let's go with the Arkansas story. <laughs> Arkansas story. <Okay. laughs> Anyway, I, I love the, the Hubble image of the Orion Nebula because it does give you that great detail. You can mm -hmm. see massive stars, you can see the colors, but you don't get the big field of view that you can get with other telescopes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. All right. Gotcha. Next. All right, here we go. Um, this is Holdwig at Thunder O Storm on Twitter. And he says, or she says, uh, or they say, if I want to be correct uh this what, person says this per it's thank po you it's possible to get through this chuck i you know it's just that once i start thinking about it i'm like well that can't be right well that's not right either what am i doing i don't know anything anymore help me help me, help me please. Okay. okay here we go <laughs> what are the projects that you think will be the most important for this current decade so we're in the 20s now Ooh. what's going to happen between 20 and 30 that is the most would this be important. what hubble would be able to contribute in this decade or is that they more don't general say, they just say what are the projects i mean of course they're talking about telescopes yeah, all right but all right. they just say what are the projects well that's a terrific question and um Hubble is poised to be a major player in these astrophysics discoveries in the coming decade. So one of them I've already mentioned is kind of getting a better grip on this idea that the universe is expanding at an accelerating rate. Um, how's that? Why is that? And how is that working? Yeah, so who ordered that? Exactly. <laughs> and so uh, telescopes like Hubble will be working um, in concert with other observatories. The Wide Field Infrared Space Telescope, or WFIRST, is a telescope idea that's being developed and, and uh, right now that will be a large, again, one of these big fields of view that can kind of give us a better sense of how galaxies are distributed and how they've been, become distributed over time. And that's related to dark matter and dark energy. Just remind me. Right. Wasn't W first a retooled, decommissioned military telescope? Right. We took a, a telescope that had another purpose, and now we're re re envisioning it uh, to do this kind of study, big big surveys of in, in the infrared, which helped reduce the cost ultimately. Um, it, that uh, was the idea. Was although the idea. sometimes <laughs> you know, like a no. <laughs> retooling yeah, things yeah, has yeah. its own complications. Yeah, yeah. But, okay. But it okay. is it is going to mm -hmm. be a, a terrific telescope. Um, I, I think when I say military, I meant spy telescope. The, right. name yeah, of the, the name of the game, I think, for the coming decade is uh, is complementary cooperative work. Let me tell you one of my favorites is that Hubble is being used in complement with probes that we're sending out to other planet, planets in our solar system. And we get much more information this way than we would by just Hubble alone or just the probe alone. For example, the Juno probe that's at Jupiter right now is getting all kinds of information about Jupiter's magnetic field and gravitational field. And Hubble is back here orbiting the Earth, looking at Jupiter, and Hubble has the unique ability to see the ultraviolet light coming from the auroras, the, the uh, magnetic poles of Jupiter. And those are dancing around relevant to what's happening with the magnetic fields around Jupiter that Juno is measuring in situ there. So this cooperative mm. work gives us a lot better understanding of these magnetic fields and what what's happening on Jupiter and and even its moons, then we could. So it's alone. not it's not an after the fact conjoining of data. No. It's an in situ. Yes, right. that exactly. is beautiful. I love really that. Cool. Right, yeah. we're doing things cooperatively with mm -hmm. Hubble. 
Uh, another example in just the recent past was when the uh, New Horizons probe um, went uh, past Pluto. But Pluto goes unmentioned here. We don't. Oh Pluto's well, not allowed. you know, Pluto is still there and it's doing <laughs> fine, right? So, uh, and, and in fact, <laughs> just because you're not taking Pluto's calls, Neil, <laughs> um, doesn't okay. mean it's okay. I'll make an exception. Phone. I'll make an exception. Okay, in fact, go ahead. Pluto is beautiful, and uh -huh. Hubble was used. As New Horizons was on its way out there, Hubble was used to find other un undiscovered moons yes. around Pluto oh. and to help New Horizons, help us chart a good course for New Horizons, and even to help New Horizons to know what objects to look at beyond Pluto. Mm. So these are things that I think are examples of how Hubble and other telescopes are going to be used cooper cooperatively in the coming years to give us a lot more information than we could from any observatory alone. Mm. Wasn't there also a mission, I have a memory, where there was a probe to an asteroid where it dropped a, 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 a projectile, which would then kick up asteroid dust. And then collect? With, no. Oh. With in a direction and an azimuth and an angle so that, was it Hubble that would then be able to see through the dust and get a spectrum? Well, that was the idea, yes. Yeah, so so it, it was, it kicked up dust, it was observed by quite a few telescopes. Oh, it's quite a few telescopes. And okay. I would have to, uh, you know, to look into the details of what was found, but I thought that was a really nifty idea. So it's another example of a, of right, a the, I'll do this and the then you do that. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Cosmic collaboration. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. By the way, what a brilliant idea. Yeah. To yeah. drop a projectile mm -hmm. and kick up the dust and then look through it. Look through it with, with ground-based telescopes or, or space-based yeah, telescopes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I I gotta say, you guys are really smart. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Chuck. Yeah, for, 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 just in case you hadn't, just in case no one's told you, wow, you guys are really smart, man. You NASA people, it's amazing what you do. <laughs> so we gotta wind this, this let segment. Me, I, I, let me, could I add one thing? Go I would be remiss, it. Chuck, if I did not bring in a huge topic of interest for the coming decade, which is the whole topic of exoplanets. Oh. Uh, and this is where telescopes will be working very, very cooperatively. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't even know back when I was in graduate school if there were planets orbiting other stars, stars other than our sun. Now, because of telescopes on the ground and telescopes like Kepler in space, we know of thousands of star systems that have planets. And so now we can presume that most stars have at least one planet. Hubble will be being used in the coming decade to do more analysis of the atmospheres of these exoplanets, mm -hmm. complementing work from uh, telescopes like TESS that's looking around for nearby systems that have planets. And so that future, finds the system, then there's the handoff to Hubble to analyze the system. Yes, that's and, and other telescopes too. Also the James Webb Space Telescope that will be launched in 2021 will be looking at exoplanetary systems in the infrared part of the spectrum, and that will complement Hubble's observations of these exoplanetary systems. Hubble can see a little in the infrared, but mostly in visible and ultraviolet light. And so we'll be getting this wonderful suite of information by using Hubble in complement with other telescopes about the nature of exoplanets. Mm. Excellent. Just think about it. First, you gotta know that it exists. Right. Then you have that catalog, and now you go in with a whole other layer of questions. Right, yes. And then that might open other questions you didn't even know to ask at the previous round. So oh, you could take wanted, this, yeah. Yeah. now you're saying, well, I want, now I wanna look at the atmosphere of the planet. Mm -hmm. You're not happy just knowing there's a planet there. Right, exactly. When there was a day when that was a banner headline, there's a planet there. Right, exactly. <laughs> right, so what a luxury to even have that ability to make that measurement. Exactly. We gotta take a break. Okay. When we come back, we'll finish out our 30th anniversary Cosmic Queries on Star Talk. Welcome back to Star Talk Cosmic Queries, Hubble 30th Anniversary Edition, with Jennifer Wiseman from the Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. Greenbelt, Maryland, right outside of DC. Mm -hmm. I've been there. It's a huge campus. I mean, it's it's it's, and it's like it's got engineers and scientists working right. in harmony nice absolutely that that's as as jets and sharks living together <laughs> jets and sharks. look at that <laughs> da -da 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 -da. boy <laughs> boy crazy boy <laughs> it's cool <laughs> i just saw a west side story on broadway Did you? yeah the the, the, the revival yeah the new okay. one yeah yeah 
What were we talking about? Yeah. The telescope, sorry. The Hubble Space about the Hubble Telescope. Hubble. Sorry. And, and sorry. the Goddard campus. And on the Goddard campus. So, Chuck, we got more questions. Yes, we yeah. do. Here mm -hmm. we go. Um, this is from Lewis. Um, I'm sorry. The Force Choked Podcast. Okay, I don't know what that is, but from Instagram. <laughs> hey, Neil and Jennifer, what is the plan for Hubble as its final photo and when Will that be? What's the lifespan of Hubble? How long yeah. how long can this mm. go on? Well, that's a great question. You know, Hubble was was launched back in 1990 from the space shuttle and it was designed to be continually replenished with the space shuttle missions which we did for for a lot longer than we originally expected. Uh, so we're not servicing it anymore because the space shuttle program is is over. We're now building a new future Spacecraft. Um, yeah. Space Force, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so we've got what we've got with Hubble, but Hubble's working very well. The last astronaut servicing mission we did back in 2009 was mm -hmm. very successful, and they've left the telescope. The astronauts went up and put in some new science instruments and repaired some other instruments and some, and some other equipment on the telescope. It's a satellite orbiting the Earth, and Hubble is doing very well right now. Okay. Did, did they and, leave graffiti on it because they're the last ones there? So like, cool. Susie was here. Uh, so cool. If they did, they didn't tell me. Yeah, no, yes, all right, all right. right. Uh, mm -hmm. But um, <laughs> Jennifer took that question a little know, personally. I know, I know. I see her get a little disturbed. Yeah, that was really was a, like, a joke and, question. It wasn't joke. And she was like, and if they did, they did not tell me. Now and that, I swear I will give them such a look. I want you to know out there that I did not have that look at all. I'm... I have we nothing. Have you on camera. Camera. I have we nothing. Got you. Too late. We're busted. Too late. <laughs> I will tell you that one of the astronauts, John Grunsfeld, who is an astronomer himself, mm -hmm. brought with him a, and a friend of Star Talk. He's been on several awesome. times. Yeah, yeah. He brought with him a model of Galileo's telescope, and so mm. up there on the space shuttle during the last servicing mission, we had this marvelous juxtaposition of this model of Galileo's telescope from 400 years ago. The first telescope. Yeah. And out the window of the cockpit of the shuttle, you could see the Hubble Space Telescope. And so it was just a wonderful uh, visual of how the progress of, of engineering and curiosity and optics all work together to give us a brand money. new understanding <laughs> money. of the universe. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> You can be as curious as all get out. Oh, well. But if, anybody, if nobody's paying nobody's for your paying ideas, for yep. you just, just right. go back to the you cave. You've got some great ideas. <laughs> well, but you have to have the ideas to get people to donate the money. So yeah. it's, okay. it's all works mm -hmm. together. All right. Right. Well, all right. speaking of that, let's but stay let me, right. Let me, I didn't quite oh, answer ahead, your question. Finish. So Hubble is um, is working very well. And so we don't really have an end date of Hubble in mind. Uh, the, the kind of stated NASA position now is as long as Hubble is being scientifically productive, we'll keep operating it. And it looks like, just from looking at the health of the gyroscopes and the batteries and the science instruments, that we'll be able to get good science from Hubble for probably through the end of this decade and maybe even Whoa, beyond. Not bad. And, yeah. and that's great because we want it to be operating while other telescopes are also operating with complementary capabilities. Right. The James Webb Space Telescope uh, should launch in 2021, and it will be a fabulous space telescope tuned into infrared wavelengths of light. Right. And so in the infrared, you can appear at galaxies that are coming, that are very distant in space and time. Their light is getting redshifted as it travels through expanding space to get mm -hmm. to us. And Hubble can't see that far into the infrared spectrum of light. So right. Hubble can see very distant galaxies, but the web will see galaxies even, even a little bit farther far. back in space and time. We're going to emphasize yeah. something you just yes. said because it's remarkable to me. Yeah. All right. So we are seeing infrared light from galaxies in the early universe who in the early universe were emitting visible light. Right. Okay. Or even so, ultraviolet. Or even ultraviolet. Right. And that all got redshifted exactly. right. over to the infrared part that oh. the James Webb Telescope is tuned to see. That's nice. right. Right. So we, we're folding in that exactly. knowledge of the universe right. to nab those galaxies right when they're being born. Right. I, I, I like to put it this way. The universe we think, at least the universe that, that, that we know and love, uh, started about 13.8 billion years ago. Okay. And Hubble is seeing all the way back right now to baby galaxies from within that first 0.8 of the 13.8 billion mm. year history of the universe. 
What? And the web will see even closer to the beginning of the universe within a, a few hundred million years of the beginning of the universe. That's you can amazing. see base, basically the cradle infant, of creation. Yes, infant galaxies that's, with that's with almost a little like gas in the and universe stars. when it's crowning. That's amazing. Well, it's amazing. <laughs> it's just like, oh my God, the baby is coming in a second now. Chuck. This is a little too graphic, but <laughs> no, stop. it's not. It's let's think a little later. Let's think toddlers. Okay, 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 all right, right, toddler, right. Toddler, right. Toddler, all right. Because not... what these telescopes are seeing are the first, after the first gas formed from the first atoms, which first from the formed from the first subatomic particles, you finally get enough gas to form stars. And these stars and gas uh, coalitions, if you will, are what we call the first proto galaxies. Right. And that's as far back. That's what the Webb Telescope will that's be we'll will see. be seeing. And over time, these these little baby galaxies began to merge together and form bigger galaxies. Right. And these grew over cosmic time into the galaxies we know and love today, like our own Milky Way, which is the product of several mergers over time. Right. Yeah. Mm. And, and and has there been any recent collisions that we have seen of galaxies? Well, of course, that we it have... takes a long time I, I for galaxies to actually merge. But Hubble, actually, that's one of the one of the wonderful discoveries of the Hubble Space Telescope is that merging is common and was more common in in the early universe. So with Hubble, we've looked out into distant space, looking back in time, and we've seen quite a few cases where galaxies are either in the process of merging or they've already merged. And that merging process creates distortions in the shapes of these galaxies because mm -hmm. of the tidal pulls and the gravitational pulls. Uh, and it's quite interesting. We believe that our own Milky Way is set to merge with our nearest neighbor, big spiral, grand spiral, the Andromeda. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and we're on a head-on collision course. That's something Hubble helped us uh, find a Thanks few a years lot, ago. <laughs> Thanks. Um, <laughs> So uh, <laughs> the night sky was going to look a lot Blame different the telescope. <laughs> in a few billion years. Right. But it won't be for quite a long time. Quite some time. Billions mm -hmm. of years. All right, staying yes. right there right. With, the, uh, with, with the future here. Um, uh, Team Forthsight Observatory wants to know this. Hi, Neil, Jennifer, Chuck. Uh, would it be possible if NASA ends funding for Hubble or um, it comes to its regular end, someone like uh, Elon Musk could buy the rights to the scope and send his own repair missions, thereby now wow. owning a telescope? Good question. Because we are seeing yeah. that, right? We are seeing. I mean, why, we yeah. are seeing the commercialization of space. We are yeah. seeing more uh, collaboration between the yeah. public, public and private sector with respect to missions to space. So, what, what, what's the feasibility of this? Yeah. Is it for sale? Yeah. Uh, it, is not, <laughs> it is not for sale <laughs> yet. Um. <laughs> yeah, if you're a billionaire, say everything's for sale. <laughs> Exactly. The uh, current plan is we'll operate Hubble for as many years as it is scientifically productive. And then when it's not um, no longer providing a, a good science, um, it will cease to function. Eventually, uh, we'll need to either push the satellite itself either to a higher orbit, we call it a parking orbit, or, or else help direct it safely into the ocean. Mm -hmm. um, Pacific Ocean. Yeah, well, mm -hmm. I don't know exactly where. Um, but... <laughs> Uh, as for private of... company involvement, we don't have any official plans for that right now. But let me tell you, there's a lot of energetic discussions out there. So, uh, you know, stay tuned for coming I years. I love yes. that idea. Right. If if it's Hubble, we're going to plunk Hubble in the Pacific yeah, or right. someone can buy it. I think let somebody buy it. Right. And continue to receive but information. Let me let me let me. Uh, Add this, though. Astronomers think about this very hard all the time. What's the best kind of facility to have to do the kinds of astrophysics we want to do? And there comes a point, such as came the point with my own car recently, where you have to decide, is it worth it to put a lot of money into continuing to refurbish something that's decades old? As they call it, nickel and diming. Exactly. You. Or is it better to build something fresh using newer technology? So, you know, oh, Hubble's not in that situation. We, we hope Hubble will be operating for, for much of the next decade and beyond. But at some point, the decision will need to be made as to whether the kinds of capabilities that Hubble does could be better done with a new telescope. And in fact, there's some wonderful concepts being developed right now for Hubble follow-ons. Okay. Fantastic. All right. All right, Neil told Chuck, me to yeah, wait, wait. make this Going the fast. last okay. one, right, for you, for you, because this is a personal question just for you, doctor. Um, and this is from 
Brett Shara. And Brett Shara from Instagram says, what is your favorite Hubble discovery? By the way, I'm a huge fan. Thanks for all that you do. So this is somebody who follows mm. you mm. and awesome. wants to know what is your favorite Hubble anything. Uh, I'll slip into my favorite Hubble discovery it doesn't sound flashy but is actually the looking at things like the ultra deep field and finding out that galaxies themselves change in amazing ways over billions of years and hubble being the time machine that it is we can actually map out by looking at distant galaxies and comparing them to nearby ones how they've changed so this ultra yes. deep field is even deeper than the original concept yes, of deep field that's right that's once right. once they got the deep field Swagger, right? It's yeah. like let's do this again. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay, yeah. let's get a deeper field. <laughs> and then uh, one one image that I just love. It's it's nothing special, if you will, but it's just a beautiful galaxy. It doesn't have a beautiful name. NGC thirteen oh nine. I just think is a gorgeous spiral. So those of you listening to this, go out and Google NGC thirteen oh nine Hubble, mm. and you'll see a beautiful spiral with some interesting galaxies in the background. And if you call and it on your phone, favorite. NGC fourteen oh nine, it'll answer. <laughs> and then there's beautiful nebulae. I'm I'm holding one now. NGC. You're holding a picture. I'm of holding one. a picture of one. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, actually, uh, it, it was on a cat's collar. And she <laughs> oh, oh, there it is. NGC three six zero three thirty six zero three. NGC thirty six zero three. It's so, a beautiful. So if someone Googles that, they'll go to this image online. Yeah, if you, yeah. If you mm -hmm. use Hubble in the name, you'll see this cluster of newly formed stars surrounded by beautiful ionized gas, a kind of purplish nebula. And to me, this just shows great beauty in the universe and how our telescopes are enabling us to see these kinds of beautiful active regions that we haven't been able to see in such detail before in human history. And this inspires all kinds of things, even beyond science, art, science, philosophy, uh, all kinds of things are inspired by the observations we can do with Hubble uh, and other telescopes today, and I'm grateful for that. So thank you for your comments. Yeah, yeah. Wow. I just looked up NGC 1309, yes. and Apple owes you guys some money. Why? Because this is what comes up on my computer. That's the Hubble image, and that's the, the pinwheel galaxy. And it, no, it's 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 not. Uh, it, it's it, they don't owe any money because all of our images are freely available to anyone. And so uh, you done already yeah. paid for it. They pay. Uh, we pay our we, tax dollars. Tax money paid. Oh, for it. in that case, Apple owes me some money. <laughs> that's right. Uh, <laughs> you can fight that out with them. Yes. Okay. Oh, we got to land this plane. All right. Uh, so, Jennifer, you have any just concluding reflective thoughts beyond what you or have the, the yeah. reflective thoughts you've already shared? I, I think that um, the Hubble Space Telescope has shown how we can use, as human, humanity, we can use mm -hmm. technology to do something that not only enhances our scientific understanding of nature, and, and but also gives us a sense of unity. There are people all over the world from every nation that are excited about the Hubble Space Telescope and what we're seeing. And it gives us, I think, I hope, a sense of unity as citizens of Earth, that we're part of a magnificent universe, an inspiring universe, something to look up at and be inspired by, and to keep our sights, our spirits high. Um, I think Astronomy inspires all kinds of positive, positive, yeah. um, and except when that asteroid deeper is coming. <laughs> deeper thoughts of, of beauty and and philosophy and and theology and art and music and all of these things are part of what it means to be human. So uh, keep looking up. I'd say. Somebody just Damn, can't, I got can't end the show but, now. You got to let her end the show man, now. I can't. You got to let her end the show now, Neil. You got nothing. I got, you got nothing. nothing, bro. I got, you got nothing. nothing. Got you nothing. got nothing. Got you got nothing, Doc. Jennifer, you just <laughs> took us out. <laughs> that was Jennifer Wiseman ending Star Talk for me. <laughs> 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 All right. We'll catch you on the next round.